An allergy, autoimmunity, inflammation of joints, and those are all obvious things. But the, the big concern is that this low level, purposeless inflammation may be setting the stage for very serious diseases that you develop you know, after midlife. What are the top foods to eat to reduce inflammation and burn belly fat? Dr. You know, I would say it's the top foods not to eat because mm. a lot of the foods in the mainstream diet are very pro-inflammatory, and that includes a lot of the fats and oils that are used, especially uh, vegetable oils with a uh, high content of polyunsaturated fatty acids. It includes quick digesting carbs, uh, you know, things with made with flour and sugar. Um, so a lot of the manufactured, processed, refined foods, these are all pro-inflammatory. And I think that's where you want to start is trying to eliminate all of those things as much as possible. What What is it about refined grain products, uh, quote unquote, inflammatory oils? Can you define what those oils are, where where they're hiding in the food supply? What What is it about those foods? Okay, let's do the oils first. Okay. And there are different kinds of fatty acids. There are saturated ones, which we used to think were bad for the heart uh, and probably aren't so bad. There are monounsaturated fatty acids, which are predominant in olive oil, and that's those are very good for us. And then there are polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are very susceptible to oxidation mm. and degradation if they're exposed to heat, light, and air. And when they degrade, they form carcinogenic pro-inflammatory compounds. And most of the oils in the American diet are of that sort. They're refined vegetable oils uh, that are very high in these polyunsaturated fatty acids and easily break down to pro-inflammatory compounds. Wow. And where, where are they typically found? I mean, what kinds of foods, foods are they typically found in? All manufactured food. You know, we've made uh, refined soybean oil very cheap through uh, federal subsidies. So it is a universal commodity crop and it's in all manufactured foods. Wow. Yeah. Big, big problem. And also, I, I feel like restaurants are probably very prone to using them because they're dirt cheap. Absolutely. So we need alternatives to them. And But with the carbs, it's a different matter. It's that when you refine carbohydrates into forms that quickly digest into sugar and raise blood sugar, uh, that provokes inflammation by a different mechanism. Interesting. Is it, a, is there a, a, is it sort of a scenario of the dose making the poison? I mean, is a, is a little bit here and there. Sure. I mean, okay. I think that's true of, of most things, uh, but at the moment, the mainstream diet is very overloaded and top heavy in these pro-inflammatory elements. Wow. And what what exactly is inflammation? Because, I mean, you're a medical doctor. You hear the term inflammation thrown about quite a bit in the online health and wellness space. Mm -hmm. But I think um, lay people uh, maybe could use a bit of a crash course on what, what it actually is from the standpoint of our physiology. Well, it's very simple. We all know inflammation on the surface of the body. It's local redness, heat, swelling, and pain at an area that's been injured or is under attack. And inflammation is the body's way of getting more nourishment and more immune activity to an area that needs it. But inflammation is so powerful and it's so potentially destructive that it's very important that it stay where it's supposed to stay and end when it's supposed to end. If inflammation persists, if it serves no purpose, it becomes productive of disease. So the body has very complex mechanisms for being able to produce enough inflammation to protect you. Um, and not enough inflammation that it's going to cause problems. So these are delicate balances of hormones and regulatory compounds. If you can't produce enough inflammation, you are susceptible to infection mm. and poor wound healing. If you produce too much, this can spill over into allergy and into autoimmune disease. But most interesting, it looks as if many of the most serious chronic illnesses begin as inflammatory processes. So it's low level, chronic, purposeless inflammation that you need to be concerned about. So it's, it's really our immune systems reacting to our diets, whereas in, in, in antiquity, historically, our immune systems would ha have had to ha have evolved to respond to physical, physical threat, right? It's not entirely diet because there are many factors that influence your inflammatory status. One is genetics. Another is stress. Uh, another is exposure to environmental toxins. For instance, secondhand cigarette smoke is strongly pro-inflammatory, for example. Uh, so, but diet is a major one, and that's one we have control over. So that's the one you want to look at because, as I said, the mainstream diet is strongly pro-inflammatory. It gives us all the wrong things and not enough of the right things that are protective. 
I feel like for people when they're healthy, chronic disease is sort of an abstract concept. So are there any short-term consequences to inflammation wrought by diet and lifestyle? Well, as I said, allergy, autoimmunity, inflammation of joints, and those are all obvious things. But the, the big concern is that this low level purposeless inflammation may be setting the stage for very serious diseases that you develop you know, after midlife, things like coronary artery disease, which begins as inflammation in the arteries, uh, Alzheimer's, which begins as inflammation in the brain. And cancer is related too, because anything that increases inflammation simultaneously stimulates cells to divide more frequently. You can't separate those, those two things. Uh, aspirin is a, has cancer protective effects because it is an anti-inflammatory agent. So, you know, this is all linked. When I was in medical school, I was taught that coronary artery disease and cancer and neurodegenerative diseases, these are completely separate disease forms that have nothing in common. And now it looks as if there's this common thread in inappropriate inflammation. And the good news there is if that's a common element, then there's common strategies for dealing with it. Absolutely. It gives us agency, which is what I yeah. love so much yeah. about your about your work. Is there any effect that inflammation has on on the burning of fat um, and, and weight loss? I think if you're in a an inflammatory state, you are more likely to put weight on and it's more difficult to come off. Interesting. Tell us about your background. You are one of the world's most respected physicians. You are one of the most prominent figures in the field of integrative medicine. You've been doing this for decades at this point. How did you get into, um, what got you interested in medicine and how did you then come to find integrative medicine and, and, and what really is integrative medicine? Okay. Well, those are big questions. Yeah. I'm always interested in science and biology. Uh, my family doctor, who was a general practitioner, was an influence on me, wanted me to go into medicine. Wow. I, I never saw myself practicing medicine, but I thought I'd want a medical education. It seemed to me that would be very useful to me. So you didn't uh, want to do residency, but you wanted the MD. Is that kind of... Yeah, I thought that would be useful. And also... Uh, I, I had too many interests and people were always after me to say what I wanted to be. And I didn't know. And it, it, it drove me crazy. So when I said I was going to medical school, it made everyone go away. Um, also, it was during the Vietnam War and it was a way of not dealing with that. You know, I got the deferment for all those years in school. At any rate, um, I had before I went to medical school, I studied botany and that's an unusual combination. Uh, so as an undergraduate at Harvard, I majored in botany and I had the good fortune uh, to study under the man who, would, who really created the modern field of ethnobotany, Richard uh, Schultes, hmm. and he stimulated me an interest in medicinal plants. So I entered medical school with that background, and I was very shocked to see that the people teaching me pharmacology had no knowledge of the plant sources of the drugs that they were teaching about, and how they differed from isolated chemicals. Uh, I also had a longstanding interest in the mind and the body and how they interacted, and I, I got nothing about that in medical education. I think that's one of the big omissions in conventional medicine. And then when I finished my clinical training uh, in an internship, I didn't want to practice that kind of medicine. I saw it do too much harm, especially in the form of adverse drug reactions. And it didn't teach me anything about how to keep people healthy. You know, I really learned nothing about health and healing. And it seemed to me that the main business of doctors should be to teach people how to live in order not to get sick in the first place. So I was very disillusioned. I dropped out of medicine for a number of years. I made my living as a writer. I found ways to travel around the world and look at healers and alternative practitioners of all kind. I did that for about three and a half years. And then my car broke down in Tucson and I never left. And, uh, uh, you know, I, the University of Arizona found out that I was there. They asked me if I would begin giving lectures at first on uh, cannabis because nobody on the faculty knew anything about it. And I had done the first uh, human double blind experiments with it in 1968. Wow. Um, and then I began giving some lectures on addiction. And I said, look, I really want to talk about alternative medicine. Nobody even knew what that was in those days in the 70s. So I started giving lectures in the medical college at the University of Arizona on things like chiropractic and osteopathic medicine and Chinese medicine. Um, and I gradually put my own ideas together. Uh, and people started showing up at my doorstep wanting me to treat them. 
so I gradually got drawn into practice. I called what I did natural and preventive medicine at first, and then I came to call integrative medicine. Wow. So you, you basically invented the field. Yeah. Long time ago. Wow. And for uh, many years, nobody paid any attention to me. Uh, I got a, a larger and larger following of the general public, but no medical colleagues listened to what I was saying. And that didn't change until the early 1990s. And that was when the economics of healthcare began to go south. And the lesson that I draw from that is that no amount of ideological argument moves anything. It's only when pocketbooks and institutions get squeezed that they begin to open up to new ideas. Interesting. I think a lot of physicians are um, are evidence based, which is a good thing, obviously. Yeah, that's good. But they are, but 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 many also are evidence bound, which I think is not necessarily a good thing. I couldn't agree more. I think in its in its most extreme form, the evidence based medicine movement is analogous to religious fundamentalism. It's scientific fundamentalism. And there are situations now where you're not allowed to give a lecture in a medical institution unless you previously submit what you're going to say and have references in journals that are approved by the evidence based medicine committee. And also doctors can't do treatments that aren't approved by the evidence based medicine committee. And those are always interventions, drugs. You know, there's a big <laughs> it's a big tangled mess involving medical journals, the pharmaceutical companies, the healthcare institutions. You know, doctors are no longer they've lost their autonomy and they're told how they have to practice. Well, I feel like the evidence based model does prevent healthcare from becoming the wild, wild west. Right. Where where we like to think that. But, you know, when you look just at medications, uh, all of this insistence on double blind trials has not kept a great many worthless and dangerous drugs off the market. Mm. So, you know, it's not it's, it is not a, a it's not a perfect system by any means. But here's what I teach about evidence to the doctors that I train. I think we should use a sliding scale of evidence that works like this. The greater the potential of a treatment to cause harm, the stricter the standards of evidence it should be held to for efficacy. If, if you know, I teach everybody breathing techniques, they, there's not a lot of published evidence on the efficacy of breathing, but I know from my own experience how valuable this is and the potential to cause harm is, is negligible. So I'm quite comfortable recommending that until we begin to get more evidence. And the reason why we don't have uh, requisite uh, the the requisite amount of evidence to convince the most ardent evidence based practitioners is that who's going to fund a study on on breath work? Exactly. Or if people are even interested in it, you know, you try to talk to uh, average physicians and scientists about breathing. It's too simple. You know, there's no device. There's no substance. How possibly could this affect anything? Interesting. And you've seen it perform oh, amazing i mean i i teach a very simple technique called the 478 breath you can find it on on youtube i i have seen miraculous changes in people from practicing this in terms of lowered blood pressure improved digestion improved circulation i mean all sorts of things from a high level what what, what does that technique uh, entail uh, you breathe in through your nose quietly to a count of four, hold your breath for a count of seven and blow air out through your mouth to a count of eight. And you do that four breath cycles. That's it. Uh, and you have to do it at least twice a day, but you got to do it religiously. And it changes the balance of tone in the involuntary nervous system. It increases parasympathetic tone, decreases sympathetic tone. And that has far reaching effects on, uh, on all functions of the body. What does it mean to um, to increase parasympathetic tone? Okay, so you know the involuntary nervous system has two divisions. One that speeds things up, which is the sympathetic nervous system. That's the one that mediates the fight or flight response, and the parasympathetic nervous system slows things down. Uh, and these two have to be in balance. And in most people in our culture, there's too much sympathetic tone and not enough parasympathetic tone. So you want to activate that. That's the relaxation response. There's lots of ways of doing it. But breath control is one of the simplest and most effective. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah. When, I, when I think of tone, I think of a, a muscle that's been exercised. Well, same thing with the nerve with nerves. It's like how what frequency are they operating at? Uh, so if there's increased tone and in, in a division of the nervous system, there's more firing, more activity. Wow. Would you say that integrative medicine really um, is about the intersection between the, the mind and the body? 
That's one big component of it. I think it's much more than that. It's the intelligent combination of conventional medicine and natural and preventive strategies, emphasis on lifestyle. But mind-body medicine is a big piece of it. And that's one that's been neglected totally in conventional training. What role does the mind play in systemic health? <laughs> I think you can't, you can't disentangle the mind and the body. They're two hmm. poles of the same thing. Uh, the only way you can separate them is verbally. Uh, anywhere there is, anywhere there are nerves, there is potential up to for mind to create an influence. So I think there's no system of the body that's not out of the range of, of uh, what goes on in your mind. And when something changes in your body, that's reflected in changes in the mind. So there is this back and forth continuous interaction. And you want to take advantage of that in medicine because the strategies that are available for you, you taking advantage of the mind-body connection are very cost-effective, very time-effective. They're even fun for both practitioner and patient, and they're totally underutilized in medicine today. And that includes things like hypnosis and biofeedback and guided imagery. I mean, there's a whole range of mind-body techniques. Most people underappreciate that I would say that the vast majority of underappreciate the fact that the mind can actually have an effect on one's <laughs> predisposition to cardiovascular disease or to forms various forms of dementia or um, autoimmunity. But you're yeah. saying that that it actually it does play a role. <laughs> it's a huge role. I studied medical hypnosis. I uh, took a course for physicians at Columbia University after I finished my internship, one of the best courses I've ever taken. And I saw demonstrations in that that were mind blowing. You know, things like you can, a good hypnotic subject, you can touch them with a finger, tell them it's a piece of hot metal, they get a blister. Wow. And you do the opposite. You can touch a person with a hot piece of hot metal and tell them it's not hot and they don't get a blister. I mean, that's all you need to see to know how powerful that connection is in your experiences is, is everybody hypnotizable because i've never been hypnotized there's a range you know there is a range of susceptibility there are some people about general figures are that 20 percent of us are highly hypnotizable 20 percent are relatively not hypnotizable and the rest of us are somewhere in between but even for the ones who are not very hypnotizable, there are ways of of taking advantage of that you know it, it's just putting you in a focused state where your scope of your awareness is reduced, but the intensity is increased. When you're watching a movie, you're in a light trance state. And when you're in that kind of state, the, the channels between the mind and the body are, are open. Uh, I work with a very skilled hypnotherapist and he's on our faculty at our center of integrative medicine. And he once said to me, and I've come to believe this absolutely, that he thought that every a uh, skin disorder and every GI disorder should first go to hypnotherapy before you go to dermatologists or gastroenterologists, because those two systems of the body have the highest ratio of nerves, uh, tissue, and they're the most frequent sites of expression of mind body imbalances. So people can have, so, so, so skin problems can be a manifestation of a mind body imbalance. Absolutely. No, you have to be careful in how you present this to people because you don't want to give them the impression that you think their disease is unreal or that they are mm. creating it with their mind. That's not the point. The point is that there's just this back and forth and you can take advantage of that connection. I just can't remember the last time I've been to a dermatologist and they asked me about how I was doing mentally. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And, you know, with the GI stuff, all you have to do is if you were in a student health center at exam time to see the number of people that come in with diarrhea, vomiting, digestive upsets and stress from, you know, that period in their lives. What are some daily habits then that you think could be useful for our, for our viewers and for our listeners to to support mental health, which I, I, I'm, I'm hearing from you plays a, a large role in systemic health, our risk for chronic disease, our, our predisposition, predisposition to weight gain. What are some daily, daily habits that people should really um, tr attempt to adopt? I think everyone should learn and practice some method of neutralizing the harmful effects of stress on the mind and the body. There's a wide range of choices, everything from guided imagery, relaxation, yoga, I personally like breath control because it's so time efficient. 
And as I said, that four, seven, eight breath that I teach, it takes 30 seconds. You just have to do it twice a day religiously. And it produces marvelous effects. Physical activity is a, it, I think some has to be a component of everybody's life. Walking can satisfy that need if you do enough of it and, uh, you know, do it aerobically enough. I think getting adequate rest and sleep, uh, that's a very key component of a healthy lifestyle. Uh, so, you know, those are some basic ones in addition to paying attention to your diet. Walking is so important. A lot of people will say, oh, well, I don't have access to a gym. How am I, how, sh how can I be expected to, uh, to, to, to be, be active, right? But walking, I think is, it's in our DNA to walk. It's like, it's part of our ancestry. Our bodies are designed for it and it carries the least risk of injury. You can do it anywhere. You can do it outdoors. You can do it with other people. It's great. And it can satisfy all, your, all the requirements for, uh, you know, using your body. I love that. Non-exercise physical activity. Yeah. Crucial. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about your background as a, as a bot or as an expert in botany and, and where that, how that has informed your, uh, your practice as a physician, because I'm, I'm imagining you have insight into the role that various plants can play in our health that few do. So, um, you mentioned cannabis, which is, uh, definitely a, a plant that falls outside of my wheelhouse, but from a, from a dietary standpoint, um, what, what are your thoughts on, on, on fruits, vegetables, um, herbs, spices, any favorites that you have from, from the standpoint of, of physical health? Yeah, I have a lot of ideas about that. First of all, fruits, vegetables, herbs, spices, beverages, all of these are sources of uh, protective compounds. We call them phytoprotective compounds or phytonutrient compounds. Uh, and there's a whole range of them. You know, the government is always telling us to eat more fruits and vegetables. I think vegetables are more important because fruits are often concentrated sugar sources. So you want to be careful about your intake of them. But vegetables, we, we really should be eating a lot. And you want to eat across the color spectrum mm. uh, because each different color has unique uh, phytoprotective properties. So you should think about, you know, what did you eat today that was orange? What did you eat that was red? And, you know, what did you eat that was green? That's a good habit to get into. Uh, uh, herbs and spices also have unique compounds in them that are very useful. Cinnamon has a, a compound that lowers blood sugar, for example. Uh, turmeric, the yellow spice, is the most powerful natural anti-inflammatory agent that we know of. Uh, and everybody should find ways to incorporate that ginger a close relative has that, those effects as well. So I think the more variety you have in, in the vegetables you eat, some fruits, herbs, spices, beverages, uh, you know, all of those things I think uh, are, are, are very helpful for us. And that's an area where the mainstream diet fails us. You know, not only is it giving us uh, the wrong kinds of foods that are pro-inflammatory, it doesn't give us enough of the things that are protective. What about for people that, that are listening to this, watching this, that, that don't like spicy food? They like foods that are uh, very simple in terms of their, um, you know, in terms of their palate, uh, bland perhaps. Is there a benefit to consuming spicy foods? Well, it depends what you mean by spicy. And a lot of people think of that in terms of chili, of, of uh, hot red pepper which I happen to like, but you don't have to eat that if you don't want it. There are lots of other, you know, tame spices, you know, things like uh, basil and oregano and parsley and uh, uh, cumin and coriander. I mean, those are not what I would consider spicy, uh, but they're flavorful and it's very easy to learn how to add them to foods. Yeah. I think a lot of people have what, what I've come to call the 12 year old boy diet especially in the, in the, within the context of the standard American diet, you find, I find a lot of people that, um, their, their palates have, don't, haven't seemed to have evolved past the age of 12. They still as adults will regularly, um, gravitate towards foods like hot dogs, hamburgers, pizza, macaroni and cheese, macaroni and cheese is a big one. It's a big one, especially here in, in Los Angeles. Uh -huh. Um, but those foods can't be providing much nutritional value beyond calorie, right. calorie density. 
yeah, you're missing out on all these elements that are highly protective, uh, that protect you from inflammation and all sorts of other things. I don't know. I was a very adventurous eater when I was growing up. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted to get out and try all sorts of different things. And I, I traveled a lot. That's been a great influence on me. When I was 17, I had a wonderful adventure with a experimental school that took a group of people around the world for 18 months and lived with native families. And that gave me a, a great perspective on other cultures and exposed me to other foods. And I've always continued to be that way. And I like to turn people onto, you know, new ideas, new foods, new flavors. What are some of your favorite cuisines? I would say Japanese. Oh, uh, that's one of my favorites. Of, yeah, I think that's, I've spent a lot of time in Japan and I, I love Japanese food. I love Italian food. Uh, Mediterranean food, I think in general, Middle Eastern food. Uh, you know, those are those are favorites. Yeah, I, I love that Middle Eastern food, Mediterranean food. Yeah, we I feel like we have very, probably very similar tastes. I'm a huge sushi fan. I don't know why I'm such a as big of a fan of sushi as I am. I think because when I was a kid, my mom and my dad only seldomly ordered it for us. Uh -huh. Um. And so for me now, whenever I eat sushi, the fact that I can now eat all the sushi that I want, it makes me feel, uh, it makes me feel successful. Like I just love, that's, that's yeah. <laughs> well, when I was growing up, there was no sushi. And then when I went to Japan in, when I was 17, I ate it, I liked it, came back, you know, you couldn't get it in the U S and if anybody had told me that cowboys in Arizona would be eating sushi, I would never have believed that, but there it is. <laughs> so, some people are concerned about, um, parasites in fish. Is that a concern for you? Do you, do you eat raw fish there regularly? Are, there are a few species of fish that that's a concern for one of them is salmon. And so there are rules that, sa you know, salmon for sushi has to be frozen for a certain period of time before it's used. And that kills the parasites. So in general, you're not going to be exposed to any of those things in a, in a sushi restaurant. Interesting. That is interesting because salmon otherwise is a, is a wonderful right. health promoter food. Yeah, very much. I used to make, there's a, a preparation called Gravlox, which is un, unsmoked cured salmon. It's you get salmon filet, you put a mixture of sugar and salt and sometimes some spices on it and a weight on it. And then 48 hours it's cured. And you can slice it and it's delicious as a Scandinavian food. But that's one, if you buy salmon to do that with, you have to make sure that it's been frozen because you can get parasites from it. Interesting. Otherwise, just make sure that you're cooking it well, if you're, if you're cooking it. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, it's not an issue. Although I don't like fish cooked well. You know, I think fish should be uh, on the rare side. Yes. No, I, I agree with you. That's, I didn't, I didn't want anybody to, to take that as, you know, suge a suggestion yeah. to burn the hell out of your food to overcook it. <laughs> Have you been to a true food kitchen in Los Angeles? Of course. I love that. I love that chain. Well, there you go. Okay. We got 40 of them now. That's amazing. And, and a lot of the recipes are my recipes. I love that. I love that. Yeah. I don't think, um, I don't think many people, cause I know that it's a very popular restaurant chain, but I'm not sure that, that as many people that enjoy the restaurant know that you're the man behind it. Yeah, I was, I created it and uh, I supply a lot of the recipes and a lot of the ingredients and it's been fun to turn people on to foods that I've always liked. I love that. Well, you're, you're obviously, uh, an expert in, in plants and how they can benefit health. What are your feelings on, um, on animal sourced products? Like what's your, what's your overall sort of guiding philosophy on, on that? My general recommendation is that people should try to reduce the percentage of animal foods in the diet. I don't tell people to become vegetarians or vegans. I think uh, vegan diets in particular, there's, there's problems there. You can get into a, a lot of deficiencies with it, but you know, one of the concerns today is about the impact of food choices on the environment. And clearly, our dependence on animal foods, beef particularly, is a major contributor to climate change. You know, it has led to deforestation in South America, for example. Uh, the feedlots are great sources of methane and soil pollution. Mm. And one of the, you know, in terms of protecting the environment, one of the most practical things we can do is to eat lower on the food chain. Uh, so whether that's eating shellfish, uh, you know, there, there's a great push to eat insects today, which are much lower on the food chain. We'll see how that plays out. But I think that I, I, there are more and more people who are becoming conscious of the importance of reducing intake of meat, especially. Um, so, I, as I said, I don't tell people to eliminate it, but I think it's good to try to reduce it and also to not fall into the habit of thinking that a meal isn't complete unless it's built around a centerpiece of meat. Mm. You know, that's, when I was growing up, that's what 
uh, how food was. I became a pesco vegetarian long ago. You know, I eat fish and vegetables. But I found when I was when I made vegetarian meals for people this is a while back, you know, people would look around waiting for the main course. You know, that's the habit we're in. That that that's that's the center of the meal. It doesn't have to be that way. What are some of your favorite other than salmon? What are, what other kinds of fish do you eat regularly? Uh, sardines, which are a, a v- great uh, renewable resource. They're plentiful. They're high in omega-3 fatty acids. They're cheap. Uh, also, another one is kippers, which is herring. You know, you can get smoked kippers, fillets in any supermarket. They're very inexpensive. I like to mash them up with mustard and, and onion and lemon juice. It's great. It's a great meal. Uh, black cod or sable fish, which is not as well known, uh, widely used in japan very high source of omega-3s that's a good one black cod is amazing i i always get that when it's on the menu in japanese restaurants yeah it's terrific it's a, miso, it's a really, miso, marinated miso, miso marinated black cod. miso marinated black cod exactly that's you're, the best you're, you're you're my guy man <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's so freaking good yeah. i wish i knew how to make that at home is that something I that's make it at home it's not i'll send you the recipe I, it's not that hard. It's pretty easy. I just give me your, your your email when you're finished. I'll send you the rest. That sounds amazing. I can't wait. That is that is literally my favorite thing in Japanese restaurants, next to the sushi. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm obsessed. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of people today struggle with with chronic disease. They struggle with with overweight. It, it's shocking to me that by the year 2030, one in two people are going to be not just overweight but obese. This is we've created this, you know, entirely. And when you look at our society and you think well, how can we change things we're in such a nutritional mess you know we have made the unhealthiest food cheapest and most available and people eat what's cheap and what's available you know that simple so you know where we how can we even begin to change this here's where, where i would start if we could get people not to drink sweet liquids that would be such a huge step and it's not just soda it's fruit juice it's energy drinks it's putting sugar in coffee and tea that single step of like not eating sweet not drinking sweet liquids would be an enormous step in the right direction <clears throat> i don't know if you saw but there was a a, a, a an article published in uh, the journal Circulation a couple of years ago that used a complex math- mathematical model to estimate that almost 200,000 people die worldwide every year due to sugar sweetened beverages alone i i I can believe it very upsetting so do you think it's a problem of willpower i mean what do you what do you think the 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 problem stems from is it just that people i think it's a a mismatch of genetics and environment you know the we have inherited most of us have inherited genes that enable us to pack on calories pack on weight when calories are available you know this is because you know we evolved through periods of semi-starvation through feast and famine eating and we've inherited these genes which make us very efficient at storing up energy when it's available and that did not anticipate that we'd be living in a time when calories would be available in such abundance and such variety that, you know, it's, it's, I say, it's a miss. I'll give you an example that where I live in Tucson, uh, just west of me, the native group that's here, uh, they're called the Oodon, they used to be called the Papagos. And when the uh, Gadsden purchase happened and we gave a certain amount of land back to Mexico, the US border was redrawn right through their territory. So half of them wound up in Mexico, half of them wound up in Arizona. The Mexican, Odom today look the way the Odom always look. They were sedentary agriculturists. They grew traditional diets, corn, bean, squash. They uh, were physically active, lean, healthy. The Arizona Odom typically weigh 300 pounds. They have 90% rates of hypertension and type 2 diabetes. The obesity often begins at age one or two. Uh, morbid obesity followed very quickly by type 2 diabetes. I mean, it's like day and night difference. And the difference is entirely that, you know, the the Mexican Odom are eating their traditional diets and the Arizona ones are eating, you know, ring dings and big gulps of soda and candy bars. And it happened over almost overnight, this enormous change. Do you think it's because they're unaware that big gulps and and other other sources of empty calories are are not good for them 
They're just not aware of that? Or do you I think, think they- that's a big part of it? And I think it's also that these foods have been made very available and very cheap. Mm. Uh, so it's just, it's too easy to eat it. And there's also been a, an, an interesting experiment. It was not large numbers of people, but they took a group of these Arizona Odom and put them back on their traditional diets and the fat melted off and the hypertension normalized and the diabetes reversed. So, you know, that's, it's pretty obvious. Wow. Traditional diets are the, are the way. Yeah. So what your average consumer listening to this shopping in, let's just say uh, your, your, your average supermarket, what are some tips um, that people can use to, to steer clear of those kinds of obesogenic foods and opt more for foods that are going to, to help them be in their best shape and best health. The easiest way is to stay out of the middle of the supermarket and just shop around the edges, you know, to shop around where the, where the produce is and avoid all the manufactured and refined food. Uh, Michael Pollan has written a lot of books uh, on uh, nutrition uh, once said that you should not feed yourself and your car in the same place. So that's a good rule to follow. <laughs> wow. You shouldn't feed yourself. So I, was your... in, um, I know. Have you been to Italy? I've been, yeah, I've been to Rome once. It was amazing. So I've driven in Italy and the, the, uh, freeways, they're called the Alpestrad is they, there's a chain, uh, of, of, you know, food places on them. It's all operated by the same thing. And when you go in the rest stops, Fabulous. I mean, beautiful salad bars and dress olive oil and balsamic vinegar dressings and wonderful, you know, wonderful food. Why do we put up with this here? You know, if I go into a rest stop on an interstate here, I'm lucky if I can get a bag of nuts that doesn't have crap in it. You know, there's like bright blue slush going around in the thing. Mm. And, you know, everything there is, is this manufactured refined stuff with pro-inflammatory things in it. And, you know, bad. This, why did we put up with this? <laughs> yeah, I got to admit, when I was a kid, I, um, I, there was a 7-Eleven close to my house. And I, every time I would go, I'd, I would grab a what are they called? Slurpee? I would, I would Slurpee, grab, yeah. grab myself Slurpee, a Slurpee. Right. right. Or how about that the big gulps are cheaper than the small size? Wait, what? Yeah, that's common that like these 44 ounce sodas are actually cheaper than the 16 ounce ones. Wow. Yeah, it's all it's all one big, you know, knotted mess there that we have to change. I think it is lack of awareness. And it's also that we have made all of these obesogenic foods so cheap and so available. At the start of our chat, you talked about uh, pro-inflammatory oils that the modern food supply is now unfortunately saturated in. But when it comes to fats that you use in, in your cooking, what are your what are your staples? I'm a big fan of olive oil, you know, mm -hmm. good quality olive oil. And why, it doesn't have that? to be expensive. You know, I, Trader Joe's has some very good olive oils that are inexpensive. Uh, that's That's my main cooking oil. If I want uh, to cook something without the flavor of olive oil, my first choice would be avocado oil. You know, it's high in monounsaturated fat, has a high smoke point, and it's become affordable. It used to be an expensive oil, but now much less so. So those are the two that I mostly rely on. Wow, we're completely aligned. Those are the two that that are really? my that are my go to. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, on on dairy fats um, and and animal source fats? Well, that's, you know, dairy fat's an interesting one because, as I said, you know, I mentioned earlier that we used to think saturated fat was like the big evil, and it turns out it's probably not as bad for us as we used to think. But all saturated fat is not created equal, and different saturated fats have different fatty acid composition. And it may be that dairy fat is one of the better ones, and not only is not harmful, but may be beneficial. Uh, and that's particularly true of uh, yogurt and good quality cheese, uh, maybe less true of butter and cream, but you know that's a very interesting new view. On the other hand, beef fat looks like it's one of the worst for us in terms of our heart health. So I think understanding these, these differences uh, is important, but it may be that I personally like good quality cheese uh, and you know not the American crap that I grew up with, but although it's changing here now, but you know, good cheeses from Switzerland, Italy, France, uh, you know, th those are great, especially from cows that graze in high alpine meadows that has a better uh, fatty acid composition. You know, it's funny, I recently went down the rabbit hole of uh, trying to learn everything that there is to learn about milk fat globule membrane. Mm -hmm. 
And, um, and it really, uh, learning about milk fat globule membrane has kind of evolved, uh, forced my perspective on dairy, um, to evolve. About and, homogenization, uh, for example. Well, yeah, but also the fact that yes, dairy we know is meant to grow, uh, bovine dairy in particular is meant to grow, a, a turn a baby calf into a cow, but it's the brain that's under the most dramatic growth and, and, and organization and development during that period. And so milk fat and milk fat globule membrane in particular, which is found in full fat dairy products, has a number of really important compounds in it that support, that can support brain health. Here's another one that most people are unaware of. There is relatively new research about the harmfulness of low fat and non-fat milk products. Uh, in order to create non-fat milk, you know, we thought we were doing a good thing by making skim milk. It's done by a centrifuge process. And so milk is separated into a fatty component and a watery component. And different hormones in milk, natural hormones, go into one or the other. Uh, and the, the watery component has more of the androgenic, the male hormones, and the fatty component has more of the female hormones. And we're finding now that boys who are raised on skim milk have a much higher incidence of acne, and girls raised on skim milk have a much higher incidence of fertility problems when they get to adult, adolescence. Uh, also, there's some studies from Finland showing that uh, non-fat milk seems to trigger the onset of type one diabetes and people who are genetically susceptible. So my taste tells me that full fat dairy products are better for me. You know, I don't like the taste of, of skim milk and non-fat things. Uh, so if you're going to eat dairy, I think you're much better off eating full fat dairy products. And it's interesting because though full fat dairy is, is a concentrated source of saturated fat, as you mentioned, Observationally, we see research um, that show us that people who consume full fat dairy as opposed to the low fat and, and reduced yeah. fat dairy seem to have better cardiovascular health, better metabolic health. Yep. Yeah, that's all really interesting. And I can't imagine life without Parmesan cheese. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy to hear that. It's interesting. Yeah, I um, I definitely have been integrating a bit more dairy into my diet. It's still interesting, though, that, that uh, a large portion of the global adult population is lactose intolerant, though. Right, but but in uh, you know good good quality fermented dairy products, uh, yogurt and and many cheeses, the lactose has been digested by microorganisms, so it's not a problem. It's interesting it's milk, milk that's the main problem for people who are lactose intolerant. Interesting, and I can't imagine that many of our our ancestors were consuming milk straight out of the cow. Right, they had right. to find a way to preserve it. Correct. Yeah, so in fermentation is a great way to do that. Yeah. Are you, do you eat eggs? Rarely. Uh, if I'm on the road, I do. I just by choice, I don't, I, I don't gravitate toward them, but you know, if I'm on the road, I might have some for breakfast once in a while. I don't think eggs are bad for you. I think that, uh, you should just eat them in moderation. Interesting. Why is that? Well, because I think there, are, there is concern about, uh, their effect on cholesterol in the blood. You know, if you eat, eat too many of them, I think they're good foods that they have good nutrients, but you just don't want to overdo it. Hasn't, hasn't dietary cholesterol been largely exonerated though? Yes. Uh, I think that is largely true, but I still think it's probably good to be moderate about eggs until we know more about them. So, you know, a, a few a week is fine. Interesting. Here's one other thing. Um, I recently talked to uh, Dan Butner, who wrote the Blue Zones book, mm -hmm. and we were talking about um, uh, different foods that seem to be in, in, that people eat in all these areas. And one of the constants that he's found is beans. Uh, and I am a great fan of beans. And I, this is one of my complaints about uh, people who are strictly paleo or keto is that they say beans are bad for you. Beans are wonderful foods. They're cheap. They're great sources of protein and slow digesting carbohydrate. They have a lot of fiber, minerals. I think it's really stupid not to eat beans. And uh, he said that in all of these blue zone areas, that was one of the constants that people ate beans. I think a lot of people avoid beans because of the tendency to make, uh, to make them gassy. But that depends on the type of bean, because beans contain uh, indigestible sugars that cause that problem. But different beans have different content of them. And some beans, like um, pinto beans, uh, navy beans, are particularly bad. And there are other beans, like anasazi beans, uh, which are great, or black beans. 
that really are not gas producing. So you want to learn which beans. Wait, so black beans are less gas producing than navy beans? Yeah. And this yeah. is due due to what again? They they uh, there are unusual sugars that we can't digest, and in the gut, bacteria digest them and produce methane, which is the source of of flatulence. But different beans have different content of the particular sugars. And uh, some of them are lower in the ones that are problem causing. Um, Anasazi beans, if you ever, you know, they, they're beautiful bottled brown and white beans. And they're, they just don't make gas. That's fascinating. Next time I'm at Chipotle. Yeah. When I get, when the guy behind the counter asks me, would you like black beans or navy beans? Not that I have a problem with beans in general. Right. Um, but, uh, but I'm going to go with the black beans. Okay. And another really good one is uh, azuki beans, which are loved in Japan. Um, so see if you can find those. Those are also great. Azuki beans. Yeah. Interesting. Also lentils. I'm a, I actually am a huge lentil fan. I'm, 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 I'm pro legumes. Uh, yeah, good. I'm glad to hear it. They're good. They're good foods. And I, I say they're cheap and, uh, you know, very important in sources of, of nutrients that we need. What's another concern that people, a common concern that people have with legumes, though? Is it the uh, lectins or, or anti-nutrients in lectins beans? Lectins is a non-issue. You it's, know, a that's just, it's just something that people get paranoid about. It has, I think, no significance. For okay, most. wait, un unpack that for us, because there are a lot of people in the prominent voices that are that that advised lectin avoidance at all costs. I, sorry, I just don't buy that. I don't think it's an issue. Where, where are lectins you typ typically found? They're in a lot of foods and they're, they can interfere with protein metabolism. Uh, but I think for most people, they just are not a concern. You know, I don't pay attention to that. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're avoiding tomatoes and bell peppers <laughs> for fear of, of lectins, you're, you're, you're doing it wrong. There is so much nutritional craziness out there. I, if you, I once just as a game said, you know, you, you name any food, I can give you an argument why you shouldn't eat it. And if it was all right, there'd be nothing to eat. There's so much, so much nutritional craziness. Um, yeah, I, it's uh, there's a lot in the online wellness uh, community. You know, some some days you'll read that eggs are bad for you, eggs are good for you, peanuts are good for you, yeah. they're terrible for you. <laughs> How do you suggest? I mean, your average consumer is left feeling so confused. Right. So. <laughs> I think Europeans look at Americans as a nation of health nuts. Uh, you know, we approach food, uh, we approach the table as if it's a minefield. You know, you make one mistake, you're, you go to nutritional hell. I think most Europeans, certainly true in Italy and France, look at food as a source of pleasure. And they just are not obsessed with these concerns about, you know, making mistakes and what you're going to do. And I think in general, they're, they're in much better relationships with food than we are. They are. I love the European kitchen. To yeah. me, it's it's very inspiring. The, the the focus on quality over quantity of ingredients, simplicity, and taking time to enjoy food and not being hung up about getting pleasure from food. You know, you're not hustled out of a restaurant. Uh, people linger over food and they enjoy it. I think they're in much better relationships with food than we are. Absolutely. What are some of your favorite beverages? Well, I am a big fan of matcha. Uh, hmm. you know, I started a, a matcha company, uh, and got the URL matcha.com wow. and we import very high quality matcha from Japan. Um, so I don't know what, do you drink matcha? Are you familiar with it? I do. I love matcha. I love, I love a good matcha latte with uh, okay. macadamia nut milk. Huge fan. <laughs> That's fancy. I like cold, unsweetened matcha and I like hot matcha, but it's got to be good quality. And an awful lot of the matcha here is not good because it's been, it's oxidized. It's lost its bright green color. It loses its, its flavor. But I'd say that's my number one favorite uh, beverage. Um, I also, we, uh, my business partner and I found, I was in Okinawa a number of times studying healthy aging there because they used to have the highest concentration of centenarians. And a beverage that I found there, which I was new to me, was cold, unsweetened turmeric tea. Mm -hmm. uh, very refreshing in hot weather. And they make it from a fermented turmeric. And so our matcha company has been importing that and uh, making it available. It's become very popular. It's, you know, it's a powder that dissolves quickly you can have it in hot water or cold water. It's really good. Wow. What are, what are the benefits of, of matcha consumption? 
Well, very high in antioxidants, uh, and it's uh, you know a good uh, content of L-theanine, which is this the relaxing amino acid that modifies the effect of caffeine. So it's not a a jangly effect like coffee. It's more of an alert, relaxed state. Um, but I think the antioxidant content and flavonoid content uh, high, and these are very protective compounds. Do you drink coffee? No, I never liked coffee because <laughs> growing up, my parents drank uh, very strong black coffee without sugar or cream. I thought it was awful. So <laughs> I never developed a taste for coffee. It's interesting. There was a study that came out recently that um, found that, you know, tea, tea and coffee consumption worldwide is associated with, with better health. Yes, I agree better cardiovascular health, better neurological health. And, and a study came out recently pointing to a potential mechanism by which caffeine plays a, a health supporting role. They found that caffeine is a natural PCSK9 inhibitor, oh. which um, in, increases the efficiency of the liver at clearing LDL lipoproteins oh. from the blood. Oh. There's a new, yeah, there's a new, um, the, the latest class of cholesterol lowering drugs on the market are PCSK9 oh, inhibitors. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So they, they do that. They increase the availability on, um, hepatocytes, liver cells, uh, of the LDL receptor, ah. which pluck those remnant LDL particles from circulation. Right. So they found that caffeine, um, at a dose, uh, admittedly a very high dose, 400 milligrams suppressed PCSK9 by 25 percent which is uh, which is pretty significant uh, and now you know it's also important to know that there's a great vari variation in caffeine sensitivity uh mm -hmm. and this is genetic that some people are relatively insensitive to, to the stimulant effect of caffeine and some people are very sensitive to it i know people who can drink who drink one cup of coffee in the morning and have no idea that that's the cause of their insomnia at night and I see other people who drink a pot of coffee after dinner and have no problems with it. So you want to find, have a sense of where you are on that spectrum. How can we find out? Well, you pay attention and also stop using it and see what happens. You know, if you, if you are, if you get a, a real withdrawal reaction, uh, you know, incredible fatigue and a pounding headache, uh, you're probably fairly sensitive and you're physically addicted to it. Uh, so it's worth finding out about that. Where do you fit on that spectrum? I'm relatively insensitive to caffeine. Uh, you know, I never really, and that may be another reason why I never gravitated toward coffee because it really didn't, it did, didn't do much for me in terms of keeping me awake or alert. Interesting. By the way, I'm also a big fan of chocolate. Uh, and in, on my anti-inflammatory food pyramid, I put dark chocolate at the top. So, wow. Dark chocolate is at the top of the anti-inflammatory food yeah, pyramid. I mean, it's a tiny thing, but it's the top. <laughs> Oh, so that means it's not a pyramid. So, you know, it's like the base is, is fruits and vegetables and whole grains, but the top is dark chocolate. Wow. What is it about dark chocolate that you like so much? Again, it's, a, well, I think it's, it's appealing. It's delicious. Uh, but also it is another very high source of, of beneficial phytonutrients and antioxidants. Wow. When, uh, <laughs> when, when buying dark chocolate, um, to maximize the health benefits, what should people look for on the label? Well, generally a, a, uh, cocoa content of, uh, 70% or higher, uh, that's what you want. 70% or higher. Interesting. What is, so what's, what's in cacao? Like, what does it, what does it do for us? Well, there's a stimulant drug called theobromin, which is in the caffeine family, uh, you know, related to the stimulants that are in tea and coffee. Uh, but then there are, you know, all of these antioxidant compounds and flavonoids and uh, these compounds that plants produce probably for their own defense that turn out to be beneficial for us. Wow. Isn't theo, theobromine the compound that kills dogs? I give, I have two dogs, uh, British and Ridgebacks. One of them's here. Both, I saw one walk by earlier. Actually, both of them are asleep on the couch behind me. <laughs> there. Anyway, oh, I, I, give them, I give them a little bit of dark chocolate every night. Interesting. Uh, they love it. So, you know, the, the thing with dogs and chocolate, yes, there are deaths reported uh, in some dogs, but it's not a, it, it's an idiosyncratic reaction. It's not a breed thing. It's like some individual dogs have some, susceptibility to theobromine poisoning. 
Um, my dogs do not. They love it. They love it. <laughs> they've been getting dark bits of dark chocolate as treats for as long as they've been alive. That's hilarious. When I have it, when I eat my dark chocolate after dinner, I always bite off a little piece and give it to them. Do you eat it every night after dinner? Is that your your go to? Often, I would say often. I do. And if I want a sweet treat, that's what I would you know tend to go for. And you're caffeine insensitive, you said. So the, the the natural caffeine content of cacao isn't isn't. Yeah, I don't notice anything from it. I think probably uh, theobromine is less stimulating for most people than uh, than caffeine. But I do know some people that will you know really get a zing from uh, from chocolate. I typically yeah I'll enjoy a little bit at night sometimes. But I do remember one time I ate too much at night. Um, and, yeah. it, and it kept me awake. You really want to uh, okay. be careful, especially if you're, if you're caffeine sensitive. Right. Hey guys, if you enjoyed that conversation, you're going to love this one. Let's talk about the potential consequences of inflammation that people might be familiar with. Sure. So, I mean, <clears throat> common things are common. Uh, weight gain is a simple one. Brain fog, joint aches, muscle pains. Those are simple ones people experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, mood fluctuations, people having heightened states of depression, anxiety, things like that. Longer term issues associated with inflammation, you're looking at diabetes, heart disease, increased risk of stroke, you know, cognitive issues. Those are kind of the long term, like bigger mountains that uh, an individual has to navigate through if they have prolonged inflammation for a long period of time. But on the day to day, I would just say, it's probably the best descriptor is I just don't feel quite right. Hmm. If that makes sense. So, um, yeah, it's, it's hard to really nail in because inflammation, when we use it in our day to day vernacular is kind of like a, an adjective, right? But it there, it's not necessarily a descriptor more as something that's, uh, that's happening biochemically, physiologically inside the body that has a multitude of impacts depending on where it's occurring, how long it's been occurring, you know, to what degree. So we use it somewhat loosely, and I don't think people necessarily understand etiology, what's contributing to it, how really simple it is to correct in terms of excessive inflammation, and also allowing people to understand that eliminating inflammation is not the goal, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we've talked about previously, the inflammation pathways are messaging pathways. We need them. That's how our immune system responds, identifies things that are not going right, tissue, foreign invaders, bacteria, viruses, whatever. So we need it. So this crusade to eliminate all inflammation is a bit uh, inaccurate and probably problematic long term. What we need to do is understand how do we control it? How do we have an appropriate amount? Because there is reasonable belief based on tons of data, both you know, case reports as well as objective, that if you can minimize unnecessary inflammation, you should live a long and healthy life. Your overall health risks, health issues should be fairly minimized. Wow. So what are the main causes of inflammation then? Yeah, I would say it's just, it's stress. So we can use that as a broad-based term. So stresses are not always bad. We have good stresses. We have bad stresses. The majority of the stress that we associate with that word are negative stresses, right? So lack of sleep, poor diet, lack of exercise, uh, work-related stress, the good stresses, eating well, strong community support, people around you that can you know, provide emotional, physical, spiritual uh, uplifting. Um, and then I think I mentioned exercise, but that's a positive stress on the body. So what we need to look at is the balance of stresses that we're being subjected to and how do we minimize the negative, maximize the positive. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes total sense. And I love that you pointed out that inflammation is not something that we just want to completely do away with. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like, you know, when when people are are Google searching with positive intent, how do I get rid of, how do I stop inflammation in my body? Right. That's probably not something that we want to do completely. Correct? Yeah. Stop. I mean, it's, it's just such a general term, stopping inflammation, right? It's like, you know, obesity, right? Excess body fat. We know obesity, adipose cells that can or that are essentially the building blocks of fat in excess in large volumes can contribute to inflammation. But if we said we're on a crusade to eliminate fat from the body, that'd be insane. Your brain's eight pounds of fat. Like we hmm. need fat. It's a building block of cholesterol, hormones, all these things. Again, what we have to understand is balance. Like what can we 
What can we introduce into our daily life that's minimizing bad, optimizing good? And then the body should take care of itself. Like it's a the most intricately complex yet also simple machine that's ever been created. And as long as we keep the environment reasonable for it to function, we should live a long and healthy life with minimal impact of these chronic diseases that have over overtaken us, that have consumed you know, the American population as well as the global population now. What are some of these chronic diseases that people seem to be suffering with? Obesity related diseases, diabetes, um, heart disease, cognitive dysfunction, which is probably correlated to um, inflammation as well as, you know, excess body fat, um, blood sugar issues. Uh, those are the, the primary ones. Uh, if you look at the top 10 sources of morbidity and mortality for the American population, you could probably argue that eight or nine of the 10 are associated with some sort of preventable illness. And a lot of those things, the root cause is excess inflammation. Does that make sense? Yeah. So like, for instance, heart disease, what contributes to heart disease? Well, it's, you know, inefficient perfusion, blood flow caused by atherosclerosis, meaning hardening of arteries. Well, how do arteries harden? If you want to get simple with it, it's it's excess inflammation in these these um, oxidative reactive oxygen excuse me reactive oxygen species that are the byproducts of inflammatory reactions are starting to change the composition of our our vessels, which are meant to be flexible so they can compensate for blood flow, and they become like a solid cement tube. And now all of a sudden, our vascular system has to work harder to get blood to tissue that needs it. So if we, again, minimize inflammation, minimize those reactive oxygen species, and that's where people use anti-inflammatories, antioxidants, things like that, we should maintain patent and functional you know, blood flow, vascular system. From a, you know, a diabetes standpoint, you know, blood sugar is something that we're starting to be able to measure almost in real time with these continuous glucose monitors that are becoming commercially available. Well, sugar is essentially you know, in large volume, toxic to the body. We need it, but we don't need large volumes. Again, not eliminating sugar from our diet completely, but making sure we're consuming an appropriate amount. If we have blood sugar that's too high for too long, that's going to impact liver function, that's going to impact pancreatic function. We're not going to be as sensitive to insulin, and we're going to see this chain reaction of things that's basically associated with a high elevation of a toxic substance that's circulating in our system and the outcomes can contribute to, you know, cerebrovascular disease or, you know, strokes and things like that, heart disease. Um, yeah, a, a whole host of, of health issues. So, <clears throat> again, like, we need to refocus our conversation, not necessarily on eliminating something like inflammation, but making sure that we are monitoring how much is present for how long. Because again, small doses intermittently for a long period of time, our overall health outcomes should improve across the board. I love that. So you mentioned that we have we have use stress, right? We have like exercise, good stress, good stress. Um, but then we have distress, bad distress, stress. Yeah, right? That's a, it's a you know I'm in distress. Well, okay, that's a bad stress. No one uses use stress. Like I'm going to go to the gym today and get some use stress, and it's just <laughs> like I'm going to go to the gym. So yeah, we we just don't we don't really understand the the stress and things like that, that's going to contribute to promoting or reducing inflammation. Paradoxically, good stress, quote unquote, good stress actually can reduce chronic inflammation. Correct. Yeah. How, do, how does that work? So it's kind of like a dose response approach, which is we're challenging our body. We're forcing it to become more resilient. You exercise at a moderate to high intensity, intermittently, you know, once a day, twice a day, multiple days in a row, you're forcing your body to basically tolerate a stress, figure out, okay, what worked, what didn't, you know, and when you're building muscle, you're basically stressing the muscle, causing it to break down at the micro level, and then allowing it to rebuild. So you become stronger and, and things like that. So those would be good stresses. Some people you know, uh, the topic of alcohol comes up in terms of should I drink, should I not drink? And the question isn't one or the other. It's, you know, how much volume are you consuming? If you're consuming more than two drinks, and I, people don't really know what an actual drink is, and that's probably a topic for a different discussion. But <laughs> if you're consuming too much, 
that's not only going to impact your blood sugar level, it's going to impact your sleep quality. And those are a confluence of negative stresses that build up. And then you're, you know, the following day, your physiologic system has to deal with, you know, things that it doesn't necessarily want to deal with. You got bad sleep, cortisol levels are going up because you're probably dehydrated, like all these things kind of compound. And then you have a, a bucket of, you know, a decent volume of negative stress, even exercise or eating clean is not necessarily going to balance that out. And if you are honest with yourself and you think about in a, you know, a year period, how much time were you, you know, working on modifying stress in a positive way versus introducing things that increase negative stresses, increases inflammation, and then you're kind of in recovery and repair mode. I think if most people were honest with themselves, they would appreciate you probably spend more time in repair recovery, which is associated probably with higher levels of inflammation hmm. versus that period of building and allowing your body to, to tolerate mild stresses that are ultimately introduced to help you grow and strengthen you know, across the board. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense. So where, what are some other types of beneficial stress? We talked about exercise, but are there any others? <sighs> um, I mean... Again, like circling back to kind of like the alcohol conversation, probably a glass of alcohol is a, you know, for some people believe that's a positive stress. Mm. Um, but you want to make sure the, you know, the ethanol consumption is a high quality. So a good red wine, uh, a well distilled liquor, vodka, gin, you know, clear tequila, something like that. So those would be positive stresses. Um, off the top of my head, oddly enough, there's, there's not a ton that I can think of right now. Well, you, I mean, you, you practice in a world-class medical facility, Monarch yeah. in West Hollywood, and you, you guys have saunas, you have cold water immersion. There we go. Thank you for reminding me. So yeah, so um, stimulating your you know, vascular system, immune system to tolerate heat and cold, what is that doing in terms of growth hormone output? Um, you know, there's cold exposure is associated with certain physiologic adaptations that may allow for increased healing and reduced body fat. And same thing with heat, exposing yourself to heat, increasing blood flow, increasing uh, filtration of your vascular system to eliminate toxins and things like that. So there's, there's methodologies and uh, modalities that have been used for a long period of time that basically just kind of like manipulated our environment, whether it's movement or, as you reminded me, uh, the the uh, heat and cold exposure that are stressing our system in a way that promotes an adaptation that's ultimately beneficial for us. Interesting. Interesting. And so when you do those, is it normal to see, because I was actually, you mentioned continuous glucose monitors. I was kind of shocked to see, I was, I was, I wore one for about two weeks and I sat in a sauna, an infrared sauna, and I was kind of shocked to see that my blood sugar actually spiked as a result of sitting in the sauna. Yeah. So I think the technology in terms of what the gather the, the data that we're gathering from a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor, is still in its infancy. So mm -hmm. we're just trying to figure out what's for people like ourselves who don't have a baseline, you know, pancreatic endocrinologic disorder like diabetes, how are we going to use this to help optimize our physiologic function? I think for right now, for most people, it's looking at inflammation associated with diet, like really what foods are causing a spike in blood sugar, which is probably associated with an inflammatory response. Um, because we've in, you know, Los Angeles and other places where preventive medicine forward thinking, uh, types of practitioners are emerging. There's a lot of testing that can try to help people theoretically optimize their life, but the evidence behind it is still being developed. So it's mm. not super strong with, simple blood sugar monitoring, like your blood can't lie. What's there is there, what's not is not, and how you respond is how you respond. Could that change over time? Certainly. But if you're trying to figure out because you're training for something or you just want to increase your daily performance, work life, whatever, you know, your body's going to give you the best indication of what's working, what's causing inflammation, what's causing your blood sugar to spike and things like that. And so now we have tools commercially available that will allow us to do that. So, um, to your point of why are you noticing a blood sugar spike? Could it be cortisol response? Could mm. it be, you know, a stress response essentially because your body's saying, okay, like something's happening. We need to increase blood flow. It's it's uh, straining your adrenal glands. We know from the Bikram yoga space that some people 
struggle with that level of heat exposure because it's stressing their adrenal glands, which is causing their cortisol to go up, which is a stress response. And when cortisol goes up, blood sugar goes up. When blood sugar goes up, inflammation goes up. So it's this cascade of your body basically saying like, all right, something's happening. We need to be prepared. We need our immune system on alert. We need blood sugar available in case we have to run from something or fight something. So it's an evolutionary response. Like we said before, though, we don't want to eliminate those things completely. We want to minimize too much bad and we want to challenge our system because when we challenge ourselves, we get stronger. We just don't want that challenge to be repetitive in high doses or high volume day after day, month after month, year after year, because at some point, the inflammation associated with whatever you're doing will cause essentially accelerated aging. And what that means is different based on physiologic system. It could be you know, DNA damage. It could be you know, vascular damage. It could be uh, musculoskeletal nervous system damage that's commonly associated with diabetes um, and can lead to all sorts of complications, vascular, neuro neurologic, and otherwise. So um, it's, it's, um, it's one of those things that we introduce in all other aspects of our life, which is moderation. Hmm. But I think when it comes to our physiologic system, we're just not really good at understanding how much is too much or how much is not enough. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense. So it's kind of like the difference between acute and chronic. Like exactly. it sounds like in that context, that acute spike in my blood sugar was actually a sign that, that I was, that I was, that I was doing exactly that. My body was responding exactly as it should have been Correct. sitting in a sauna that, yeah, that I, mean, I was again, having a stress seeing, response. Yeah. You're seeing your blood sugar go up. Like it's great yeah. data to have, but what does that one data point look like over you using infrared sauna three to four times a week for a couple of months? Like if, if you could track that and see how your body responds, like, is it better tolerating the stress based on other components of your life? How much sleep did you get the night before? What was your food intake? Like there's a lot of variables that could have contributed to that response. So like specifically taking that one piece of data is a little bit difficult to determine its impact. But to our point, like now we can better uh, evaluate a lot of these things. So hopefully people have more information, which can lead to better informed decisions so that we can minimize the amount of inflammation that we're exposing ourselves to, you know, over our, our lifetime. So it sounds like acute stress can actually reduce the risk of chronic inflammation, but chronic stress increases the risk of chronic inflammation. Would you say that's, that's yeah, accurate? Yeah. So acute stressors can ultimately, uh, allow us to develop resilience hmm. for things that are going to inevitably happen through our life. And that's, that's so important. important. Correct. The downside of chronic stresses is our physiologic capability has limits. For instance, the immune system function, to use an, uh, a basic example. If you are diabetic, blood sugar is not well controlled, you are going to have a higher baseline level of inflammation than someone that is not. Hmm. Well, we know that your immune system, white blood cells, respond to inflammation signals because they are basically designed to say, okay, if cells are producing an inflammatory response and inflammation molecules, they're proteins, like they're, they're legitimate proteins. Your immune system is going to respond. But if you're constantly being inundated by this inflammation signal, we only have so many immune cells, right? So we can only allocate so many resources to that response, which increases your risk for colds, bacterial infections, things like that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Well, the body is going to try to reproduce more white blood cells, more immune cells. But think of it like um, an analogy I use with patients is like, zipping up and unzipping a zipper. If you keep doing this a lot, eventually a prong may bend and then all of a sudden the zipper isn't working quite right. Well, that's the problem with chronic inflammation, chronic stress to the system over a long period of time. You know, all we need is one mutation and something, you know, negative could occur from, you know, the cancer side or another, you know, uh, potentially more impactful disease. So from an immune system, long-term health, as we're like kind of circling back to what I talked about initially, if you want to live a long and healthy life and keep our body functioning at the level that we know that it is capable of, that's been demonstrated in blue zones and other pockets of the world's population, we want to keep our resources as functioning at as high a capacity as possible. And if they're constantly having to respond to these inflammation signals from whatever source we're introducing them, lifestyle, disease, you know, or, or otherwise, ultimately we are probably going to truncate 
our quality of life for sure, and probably our, our lifespan. What about exposure to environmental toxicants? Is that something that, that plays a role? Absolutely. So um, that is a, you know, within the pantheon of human existence, a more relative hmm. um, stressor that we haven't had to deal with up until probably the last, you know, 50, 100 years. Um, and what is that looking like? Well, we're consuming things that we've never consumed before, synthetic ingredients, colors, flavorings that are ultimately designated, generally regarded as safe for human consumption, but we haven't done the work, we don't have the evidence or the studies to really say, what is this going to do to us long-term? Mm. As long as it's not gonna cause immediate harm, then they're released for utilization. And a lot of these things haven't been completely vetted out or completely studied um, because there's just so many of them. And that's just from a, a food perspective, food and drink. We're also seeing with sunscreen is probably the most famous one recently. Studies have come out saying like a lot of these synthetic um, ingredients that help with the um, smell or the color of these, these balms and sunscreens we've been putting on our body, like, well, the skin's the largest organ in the body. So if it's getting on our skin and it's going into our skin, it's getting into our bloodstream, what then happens? And we're starting to see impact on hormone output, thyroid, testosterone, estrogens, progesterones, and things like that. So um, it's the analogy I use with, with patients is it's kind of like we've started slowly poisoning ourselves over a long period of time. And now we're starting to turn the corner on, you know, beauty products that are vegan, cruelty free, you know, foods that have to identify, are they genetically modified? What are the other artificial ingredients in there? And people on the coast are becoming more aware of the, you know, whole food, plant-based, grass-fed, grass-finished, organic. But there's a large population of, of the United States and the world that may not know or may not have access. So they're still being forced to consume things that have components that, you know, may be harmful to their health, most, you know, probably harmful to their health. Um, in terms of environmental exposure, like air quality, I have no idea what we do about that. Like, wow, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not your guy to, uh, to solve <laughs> that problem. Um, but that's a big one, especially in Los Angeles. Well, I can, I can offer one solution. Yeah. Better ventilation Better in ventilation. buildings. Yeah. Sure. As buildings work to become increasingly more efficient and cost effective, they become, they become increasingly, uh, well, well sealed, right? Yeah. Like they become like hermetic chambers essentially yeah. because it, it reduces, uh, heating and, and air conditioning costs. Yeah. But that actually comes with a dark side. Like yeah. that's a double-edged sword. Yes, yeah. it reduces cost for the building, yeah. right, and the company, but it increases our exposure. It increases the concentration sure. of volatile organic chemicals sure. in uh, in the air that we breathe. Yeah, it increases it CO two. Conversation as well. of good stress, bad stress. Like we're doing something to minimize a stress, which is cost, but we're also increasing a stress, which is exposure to things that may be permeating our our environment for longer than, you know, we're used to, or we're not able to filter as well. So again, like it's, uh, you know, for the most part, it's kind of a balance of how much of the good and bad are you allowing yourself to be exposed to? And then the body will take care of itself from there. So, um, staying inside all day, not getting fresh air, um, you know, from a filter standpoint, especially in buildings that are older, I live in a, in a, an apartment that's probably hasn't been updated in 60, 70 years. Like I have no idea what I'm exposed to from the ducks and, and all that, that stuff. So um, you might still have lead in the paint. I might. I have no idea. Yeah. I guarantee you I did not check when I moved in. So those are some things that it's, you know, it's somewhat overwhelming if someone's trying to just you know look at themselves 360, everything that's involved in their life from, you know, soup to nuts and try to figure out exactly how they can you know, optimize everything. Hence why I take the approach with individuals of like, let's control our controllables and things that are relatively easy to introduce because a lot of people can't even do that. And it's not necessarily their fault. They just don't know, you know, so we've talked about in the past sleep, how much hydration, how much should we, should you be consuming nutrition? How much food should you be eating based on your lifestyle? And then you can dive into What's your quality? What's the quantity? What works best for you? Intermittent fasting. There's multiple levels to that. Movement. 
the World Health Organization has recently updated their guidelines and said everyone on earth should try to achieve 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity per week. Moderate intensity activity. For you and me, that's probably similar. Similar, you know, For my parents, moderate intensity looks a little bit different, but their data indicates 80 to 85% of the world's population doesn't hit that positive you know, stress level of moderate intensity, which helps with immune system function, mood, and things like that. So what I try to, to do with any individual that I talk to, a patient or not, I'm just like, which of those things can we improve? Hopefully all of them, because then if you look at other aspects of your life that may be contributing to some sort of stress leading to inflammation, there are things out of our control. So let's control our controllables. Let's try to sleep enough, drink enough water, move enough, eat appropriately, you know, and then the intang- intangible uh, element of you know, your community, your support system, your friends, your support, like that emotional aspect uh, of your health, like, you know, try to optimize uh, that aspect as well. And then you should probably handle and be a little bit more resilient than individuals that are not doing that. Um, But I think from a foundational perspective, at least in my opinion, that's where I'm introducing a lot of my effort and energy, which is to get people just to understand the basics. Like, you know, you can't walk before you crawl and you can't run before you walk. So like, let's get the foundations set. And then we can introduce a lot of the things that, you know, your guests and you're familiar with, which is a little bit more advanced intervention to kind of tweak and fine tune. I'm seeing people that, you know, and it's a majority of people that they're not even they fine tuning what like you don't have anything going on. So because uh, your foundation is not solid. So that's, that's a lot of where my my time and energy goes is trying to get people to understand those foundations so that their body can be resilient so that they can tolerate all the various stresses that they're going to be introduced to. And if you can tolerate those stresses better, you'll, you know, better handle the inflammation that's inevitable in life. And if you can handle that and monitor its volume, you know, your body should do exactly what it's supposed to do, which is function, allowing you to do what you want to do for as long as you want to do it. Time will come for us all, but hopefully you know, our, our health span is prolonged by minimizing the amount of stress and inflammation that's contributing to potential, you know, breakdown and, and negative health outcomes. I love that because sometimes you can't, I mean, th- th- this notion of cultivating res- greater resilience, because sometimes you can't control the environment no. that, that you are tasked with having to navigate. I mean, sometimes you, you just have to work in an office. And breathe in the VOCs and the and the the increased levels of carbon dioxide and all of the you know unhealthy lifestyle behaviors that accompany that. But what you can do is you can cultivate greater resilience. And we've talked about exercise. We've talked about you know getting your sleep right. But from the standpoint of nutrition, is there any way that you can eat your way to a state of greater resilience so that you have a, a mm-hmm. greater uh, level of protection against inflammation? So we can approach this one of two ways, right? What are you going to eat that's going to help reduce inflammation? The common ones, you know, turmeric or curcumin, very common. A lot of parts of the world, the Middle East, that's a staple of their diet. And if you look at the inflammation-associated illnesses, cognitive, physiologic, and otherwise, significantly less than the American population. Mm. And the hypothesis is, well, they're consuming a lot more curcumin than we are. Probably reasonable. The other way that you can look at it is what should you not eat, right? Because even if you're taking turmeric every day, but your diet's high in simple processed foods, you're consuming too much alcohol, you're not getting a wide variety of fruits, vegetables, fiber that helps feed our gut so we can process things appropriately. And then once they do ent- eventually enter our bloodstream, they're, not, they're, they're processed in a way that doesn't cause an inflammatory response. I think we're learning more about gut health and the microbiome and understanding if we're not digesting things appropriately, we're basically being exposed to food molecules that are half digested. Mm. We haven't seen before in our immune systems like, well, this is new. So let's, you know, uh, send the signal to investigate this. And that's where the idea of these food sensitivities comes along. So I try to help patients understand there are things that we know are beneficial from reducing inflammation. Like I said, curcumin, fish oil, vitamin D, those are pretty well studied and evaluated, but there's not enough of those three things, those three things in the world to overcome 
an unhealthy regular diet on a daily basis because you're eating three meals a day. And if three meals a day for 52 weeks out of the year, 50% is good, 50% is bad, like there's not enough supplements or, you know, things that are going to help you. So that's from the supplement side. From a food side, I think we are wildly under consuming the amount of fiber that we need. So, you know, more whole food, plant-based, Mediterranean style eating. Doesn't uh, fiber actually help you poop out toxins? Yeah. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not really complex, but essentially what we're doing is we're feeding our gut bacteria. We're in, uh, introducing a, a compound that may or may not be completely digested. And when it's not part of the, the reason we want to consume fiber is because it's going to draw liquid into our, our intestines so that we can evacuate stool, which is essentially a reservoir of waste. If you're not moving that stool, you're basically keeping this garbage in your intestinal system for a longer period of time. And your intestines are highly vascular. So, you know, the longer it's in there, the more likely, you know, something may get back into your system. So we want that fiber to feed our gut, to help with digestion, to help with regular bowel function so we can evacuate things that we don't need. And if you don't do that, then, you know, it's like sitting in a poorly ventilated room. Like the longer you're in there, the more you're exposed to things, the more likely they're going to impact you. Wow. Does that make sense? So yeah. that was a little bit of an odd analogy that just came to me in the moment. So, um, yeah, it's some, that's something to think about in terms of just your basic diet. And I try not to get stuck on necessarily prescribing a specific eating style for people. I think there are multiple variations. Ultimately, for me, the best nutritional program is one that you can stick with. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here, and I'll see you there. It's almost 10% of the population, if not more, that has problems with gluten, whether they are cognizant of it or not, right? Yeah. So it's very possible that by cutting out bread, which is the number one source of gluten in the American diet, you'll see an improvement in your psychological symptoms. Interesting. Yeah.